Okay, we are now recording. Hi, my name is Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the uh, State Authorization Network with WCET. So those of you that have worked in that area of state authorization compliance, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to um, meet and talk with you in the past, but I'm venturing out. I'm getting exposure to other uh, policy areas, which I'm really pleased uh, to do. And I um, am grateful that I get to work with the um, accessibility work group that's part of WCET. And I'm gonna introduce them in a minute. Um, but I welcome you all. I was mentioning just uh, before I started the recording that uh, this is something that um, this kind of dinner party that we're doing is meant to be a casual opportunity for conversation among members. So that's why we've limited to approximately 50 people um, so that people can um, can share. Uh, and in this particular situation, we're talking about accessibility, especially uh, considering the quick pivot that a lot of institutions had to do in the middle of the spring semester um, in response to COVID-19. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to first, I'm going to introduce the um, members of our work group and uh, one of our work group members colleagues to share a little bit about what's gone on uh, with their institutions and organization. Uh, it to kind of warm up the crowd, if you will. And so what I'm hoping after that is after they've shared some of their experience that some of you all will be willing to do that as well. And uh, this is in uh, meeting mode, not webcast. So we have the chat. And so um, to try to make this easier for folks, and, and since we have 50, um, if you wouldn't mind, if you've got some thoughts, um, if you could put it in the chat, and I'll go systematically back through that and, and um, reach folks, and you can unmute yourself um, to share it uh, verbally, or if you would prefer, I, I can... Um, read your comment to the group, but the, but the point of it is that um, we really hope that you all will interact with us and share uh, what's been going on um, as you do this work recently. You know, what are your successes, of course, um, and what are the bumps that you've hit? And maybe amongst us all, we can come up with some um, brainstorming and solutions um, to try to help our institutions. So uh, first, I'm, as I said, I'm going to introduce the work group with WCET. We're very fortunate. We have Brenda Boyd uh, from Quality Matters. Hello, Hi, Brenda. Um, we have uh, Mark Picaro from Wichita State University and uh, his colleague, John Jones. Um, so we're really grateful to have them. And then we have Justin Lauder who is from Texas Tech University. And I wanna point out that I know how to spell his name and I wanna to apologize to all of you when you saw the invitation, I spelt it wrong. Um, and I even know that as I'm typing it and I still did it wrong. So I feel terrible about that. So I apologize, Justin. Um, so I'm really glad to have uh, these four folks with us um, who are gonna share a bit about what's going on with their agency and institutions. And, uh, and if you will, uh, Brenda, may we start with you? And, you know, your focus, um, you know, as we've been going through this these last few weeks? Sure. Um, Quality Matters has done a few um, things for the community. Um, and we did have a, um, a Frontiers blog post last year about the accessibility and usability resource site. I just added the link to the chat about um, the accessibility and usability resource site. This is free and it's open to everyone. Um, so if you um, have some accessibility challenges, um, which we know that this is a challenging time, but if you're, um, as you're moving online, we all know that it's very, or maybe we are learning, <laughs> that it's easier now to make your materials accessible as you're doing this pivot, even though there's so much going on. Um, because it is so much more work to go back and do that later. So um, the other thing that Quality Matters has done um, at this time is, which is for everyone in the community, is the um, Emergency Remote Instruction Checklist. And I posted the link to that in the chat as well. And this is a, it's a checklist for, you've got to move everything online. Here are, here's a set of priorities and then some next steps and then thinking longer term. So it's kind of a phased approach, mapping what you need to do to the QM standards and that it does include some of the accessibility standards. So thinking about the 
the near term, the immediate needs, and then the longer term as well. So um, we are also putting together some professional development that will be available for people to take in addition to our usual professional development. So if you have questions about that, please let me know. But um, we've, we do have some web conferencing workshops that are very short, like two hours long. You don't have to take a two week long workshop to um, learn how to make materials accessible. So um, so we have put some of those things together in response from what we've heard from our community, which is also the WCET community. So, um, so, we, so those are some of the things that we've tried to do to, you know, writ large to help the um, community with this pivot to online. But I know that um, Mark and Justin have been in the trenches and John have really been doing the work. So um, um, I'm happy to answer any questions as well. So, Thanks very much, Brenda. Um, I think that people probably will start to have some questions. So I'm really glad to have you here um, as we move forward and get to the um, aspects where we're, we're maybe problem solving. So thanks very much again for being with us today and sharing these links. And uh, I will send out these links as well after so that everyone has access to them. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, let's see, could we move to Wichita State? Moving on to Kansas. Um, Mark and John are with us today. And uh, I, as Brenda said, they've been in the trenches. So I'm really interested to hear, you know, um, how things are going for them. Uh, I'll go ahead and start. Uh... Yes, John and I are social distancing. We're not in the same place. So <laughs> he's, uh, he's about uh, three mi six miles away from where I am right now. So uh, I think that's pretty good. Um, we have uh, a history of working with accessibility on our campus, uh, primarily in the face-to-face -face space, and John will be able to speak a lot to this. And that history has helped kind of create a culture in which people are thinking accessibility first, a lot of times in creating course materials. So the people who've been creating hybrid materials and so forth, it's not as far of a stretch for them to go into completely online. Um, I'm, I'm one of the guinea pigs. I started teaching this term as a hybrid and uh, it was easy for me to create all of the lecture materials I had with scripted texts. And that's really what for me, made it um, an easier transition. It made it easier for me to actually make the video since everything was scripted rather than trying to do post-edit um, transcripting, which is a, a painstaking work as John can talk about. Um, <laughs> as he raises his eyebrows and saying, yes, I completely <laughs> agree. Um, so we have kind of a culture of doing a lot of this and it made it in some ways, it makes it a little bit easier, but it really is still a monumental lift for a lot of faculty who've not had to grapple with that. So um, I think it's fair to say we are like everyone else in the triage type mode where we're basically trying to sort out who needs the most um, resources up front and then uh, for immediate need for the students who have uh, registered uh, needs with our Office of uh, Disability Services and then moving from them into making sure that everything we have moving forward, if it becomes anything that's a durable object, it will have to be completely accessible. This is not just a, hey, I made that during that, you know, that COVID thing that happened. I, so that must pass. You know, we're not, we're, well, I don't think we're going to let any of that fly. It'll definitely have to uh, pass the test of accessibility if that whatever the faculty made during this time is to have life after this. So maybe John can enlighten more with his <laughs> even deeper in the trenches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm the one with the dirt under my fingernails more, <laughs> which means I'm not as polished and polite as, as Mark is. So I will say things like we uh, uh, got into the, the, where we are and our, our uh, focus on accessibility, thanks to a uh, uh, agreement we signed with the national federation of the blind almost four years ago, uh, which means our deadline is coming up in mere months and it's totally not uh, uh, stressful at all. Everything's great. Um, but uh, one of the things that made our agreement interesting was it did have a, a stipulation or a, a real focus on face-to-face -face instruction, which is pretty unusual for a, uh, uh, an NFB agreement. An awful lot of what goes on with the NFB and, and uh, especially when we're talking about visual impairment issues is, uh, 
the focus is really on online learning um, and, and problems with uh, the online environment. So um, when we started looking around for face-to-face -face standards, um, nobody had them. We called uh, most of the institutions that had had uh, big settlements with the NFB or the um, um, OCR uh, uh, judgments and, and stuff like that, um, or, or resolution agreements. Uh, and nobody had had to face online or face to face before, or at least that that had standards for us to look at. So we developed a set our, of our own, um, which are available through the university's uh, accessibility pages. Um, but uh, um, those really focus on trying to make sure that whatever we're doing in that face to face classroom is something that can be appreciated by everybody, regardless of some variations in ability. So if you're putting something on the screen, you're also expressing it in a verbal way. If you're putting something on the whiteboard, same thing. Um, we uh, developed a, uh, a standard for how big text needs to be displayed. Um, that, thanks, Mark, for putting the link in there to our accessibility pages. Um, we, we created some standards for uh, how, uh, that, how big text should be. Um, and and a, one of the standards you hear a lot that's just sort of a rule of thumb is 18 point font in your PowerPoints. Always use 18 point font. And the problem is that 18 point font is incredibly variable depending on uh, the particular font face you're using, the resolution size of the, the screen, the, the different distance, the, the size of the screen, the distance of the projector, all of those variables make it a really sort of uh, uh, shot in the dark. Um, and what we wanted to do was really focus on the experience of the people in the room. So we created uh, something uh, we called text size stickers that we put up in every classroom that uh, just sit next to the whiteboard or next to where the screen comes down. And it says the text in this room or on the screen should be this high. And it was, you know, several inches high. Um, depending upon the size of the room. The standard is um, based on ADA sign standards and the, um, the text needs to be an inch for every 10 feet of usable space. So if the seats are 40 feet, the, the, the furthest back seat in the room is 40 feet away from the board, then the, the text needs to be four inches high. And these stickers give a visual indicator of that. Uh, and the, the real benefit of those in the actual classroom was that the stickers were there and the students loved uh, reminding the faculty that that was a standard they needed to hit and the faculty hated it. Um, but uh, it had the, the effect of keeping that reminder, keeping accessibility a constant thing in their, everybody's visual field. Everybody had to uh, keep in mind that this accessibility. We're a, a Blackboard Ally school, and that has the the, the little dials and, and stuff like that that appear in Blackboard um, related to the accessibility of documents and stuff that are in there, has that same effect of always reminding you in a relatively subtle way that accessibility is a thing we're all thinking about. Um, I have, um, I, I preloaded that link, I'll talk about that in a minute, to a, a website called KSARN. Um, KSARN is a Kansas Accessibility Resources Network. As we've developed a lot of the things that we've been putting together, we have tried to uh, make a lot of the stuff available in a public way so that nobody else has to spend the time figuring it out what we did. And so the second link I just posted is a link to a page where you can see a description of those text size stickers and uh, you can download Photoshop files so that you can replace your own colors and your own uh, uh, institution initials and make your own stickers that way. Um, the, the first link is a link to the same website um, where we have a, a library of short uh, trainings that we've made available. Um, this was another one of those issues that we realized was a problem as we really started digging in, where our standards now and the standards of the agreement that we have with the National Federation of the Blind says that all instructional material must be accessible. The problem is that um, publishers and faculty aren't the only ones producing instructional material. Students are also producing material that's used in an instructional way. And if that isn't made in an accessible way, then we have a problem. But in most cases, our faculty weren't in a position to provide the training and how to make something accessible to the students. So we built out these, uh, the, the trainings that are on that page 
uh, with an eye towards this is something that it's a badge training. It's it's uh, we're in the process of transitioning from credly to acclaim, but it's it's a quick badge that somebody can earn and then demonstrate in a class or in whatever other uh, venue they need to that they've earned it. Um, but there's uh, how to create documents in an accessible way, how to give face-to-face uh, -face presentations in an accessible way. Um, there's a quick training on web accessibility that's really aimed at people who are um, just using a content management system and don't really know anything about HTML, just to give some foundational training in how to uh, really try and be accessible in all these different ways. So that stuff's all available out there for free. We encourage folks to take a look at that. Um, but as, so then we have all of those sorts of resources as we've been transitioning to uh, remote instruction uh, in this term, we're really trying, we're having to, you know, look at a lot of different challenges, like how do we deal with the, the sudden spike in need for things like captions and stuff like that. In the short term for the, the classes this spring, um, the, we uh, sort of uh, focused on a, a reduced standard where um, because we know all of the students who are in a particular class and assuming that there isn't a student in there with an accommodation, we can use video without captions in that class because it's a controlled audience in a way we wouldn't be able to say even about a class this summer because those rosters aren't set yet. So anything that we're preparing for summer, we do have to prepare with captions. But in this short term space, uh, we can uh, live without the captions unless we know that there's a student who needs them. Um, that's getting us over this this hump of having to produce in two weeks. But uh, it's it, there's a lot of decisions like that and I'm rambling and monopolizing, so I'm gonna stop. But uh, uh, I'm happy to talk about any of those sorts of specific issues or anything else like that that we can help with. John, that was excellent. You provided us with great information <laughs> and I love how you tied it into also what you had to do in a mid-semester shift, because that I think is, is, is something that's you know, of concern um, to most institutions. So um, thank you for sharing that. I, I am confident we're gonna be coming back to you um, <laughs> with some questions in a few minutes, but I'd like to uh, turn it over to Justin uh, Louder, please. And Justin, if you could introduce yourself and, and share a bit about what's going on down in Texas at Texas Tech. Sure. Thanks, Cheryl. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm Justin Launer, uh, Associate Vice Provost for, for e-learning at, at Texas Tech. Um, so Texas Tech has, has made a commitment for, for online accessibility for, for a number of years. Um, we actually have a strategic plan for accessibility that we drafted um, for, for faculty to utilize for, for online web-supported hybrid classes um, that's been making its rounds through, through the different groups um, on campus. Um, we're also an ally school, um, and so I'll, I'll talk about that uh, a little bit as well. Um, in the chat, I, I just posted the, the link to the online accessibility lab um, at, at Texas Tech, which will show all of the information we've got and the trainings we do and things like that. Um, but, but the thing I, I want to focus on really is, is how we've made this, this pivot, the very quick pivot that we, we have all had to do. Uh, some of us with, with a week's notice, some with two weeks notice, um, some with, with maybe a little more or even a little less notice uh, and how we kind of made that happen. Um, we, we've kind of done it in a triage nature, which most like most all of you have as well. Um, we have ramped up our budget for um, captioning because we can no longer do it all in house. Um, and so we're using a, a third party vendor um, and, and paying a premium for 24 and 48 hour you know, return time. Um, but we had to do that because um, like John, um, we, we had a list of all the students that we knew um, needed accommodations from the Student Disability Services Office. And so we could be proactive and, and reaching out to the faculty. Uh, we didn't know what students they were. We just knew what classes uh, these students were enrolled in. They, they, we weren't breaking FERPA or anything like that. Um, we, so we reached out to faculty um, directly and, and started captioning either previously done lectures that they did last semester just to get us started um, or we talked the faculty member through building um, lectures if they want to do lectures um, through media site on their their home desktop um, so then we could grab them from media site and caption them um, so that was kind of our first kind of triage thing uh, within a within a first couple of days trying to be a little more proactive 
Um, like many of you, we, we struggle with accessibility on campus. Um, and, and the constant you know, comment I get from faculty is, well, I don't have a student that needs accommodation, so I don't have to make this accessible. And then we, of course, have the conversation, you know, yes, but and what we like to tell faculty is, and others is that, that we all use curb cuts and the ramps and, and sidewalks, uh, and those are made for individuals with mobility issues, not for um, somebody that didn't have it, but yet we all benefit from it. So we've been having that conversation on campus, and, and as I said, we have this accessibility plan moving through. Um, so we rolled out Ally about a year, year, year ago, um, we've been making a push there, and so the the I don't happy accident, if you will, is that we had laid enough groundwork that making this pivot was not as painful as it could have been, uh, because we had had the conversation and we've been talking to faculty uh, for the last couple of years about about accessibility and the importance there, uh, but it's still been difficult, um, and and I get daily emails from students um, that that are having trouble with content or can't get access to certain videos and we're trying to work through that. Um, the, the biggest issue we've had, which um, I'm glad we're doing a dinner, dinner party here that we can all talk about, the biggest issue we've had um, are, are journal articles that faculty are, are putting into their class that normally they would have handed out, you know, uh, sheets in class to talk through and now they've, they've uploaded them. Um, so they're not OCR um, or they're pulling them off of databases that are not ADA accessible. So that's causing us a little more in terms of headaches than, than anything else. Um, but, but it's a process and it's moving through. Um, and, and as like, like Mark, you know, we're telling faculty right now, we may have a little bit of leeway with some of this because it is an emergency situation, but um, we need to start planning for a possible online summer, which means we don't have that kind of, of leeway. We've got to make sure content's accessible. Um, and ultimately, we may have to have either an online or a hybrid fall, um, and we need to start making that plan um, as well. We have no idea what's gonna happen. Uh, and so, you know, what, what might work this semester on emergency, you know, pivot, uh, moving to a remote teaching. Um, and, and we're saying remote teaching, not online, because, you know, good online teaching takes months, not a week and a half. Um, so we're, we're saying we, we've gone remote, um, but, but what works now is not going to work in the summer or the fall. And so we need to start making those plans um, now to, to try to help faculty. Uh, so I look forward to our conversation and, and the questions um, and learning from each other. Um, so Cheryl, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Justin. All of you brought really good pieces to this conversation. You know, we're talking about not only the emergency situation, we're talking about um, making sure that we move into, well, we manage the emergency and then what are the ways we're accommodating there. Then we're talking about what if we've got summer semester coming up that we need to prepare for. And of course, um, might there be a fall situation that needs to be anticipated and planned for um, since we have that capability given the time factor. So uh, we have, I'm so happy, we have more than 40 folks on the call here. And I'm hoping that, um, I, that one of you may volunteer and tell me how it's going at your institution and maybe we can talk a little bit, you know, let's, let's start with successes maybe. Um, you know, if, you, if anybody wants to share a, a success, um, I'm, I'm actually willing to take whatever uh, you're willing to share with us. Um, uh, Denise, I see uh, that you're sharing with us in the chat. Denise, would you like to share that with us uh, verbally? Can you unmute yourself um, there? I can, there I'm unmuting, is. but I, I'm not uh, turning on my camera just yet. We um, actually, there's a few of us here today from Landmark College in Putney, Vermont. We are um, a college for students, specifically for students who learn differently. Um, and our online courses from my um, specific department is for dual enrollment. Um, however, the entire college about a week and a half ago closed down and all of our faculty members had a week to bring their courses online. They're teaching from home to students who learn differently um, and have difficulty with executive function. Um, so we, our um, dual enrollment program has been um, catering to this population of students for quite some time and we've been assisting with that transition on the academic side. Our faculty is 
heroic in their abilities to have uh, brought their courses online. However, many of the um, classrooms were already accessible to our students um, in many different ways. So I just um, commented in the chat that on the campus, we always had something called course packs, where an entire course was um, made accessible to students. Um, they could purchase it. I, I believe they could purchase it. Maybe it, it came as part of the course itself if they wanted it. And it was an OCR PDF of all pieces of that course. So um, all assignments, all journals, um, all pages. We use Canvas as our learning management system. So everything that would have been in that course was available in that course back in an accessible format, whether it was taught uh, brick and mortar or online. So that, I was just making that comment and we're very proud that we did that prior to COVID-19 um, and it's come in very handy now as well. Thank you very much for sharing that, uh, Denise. Um, you know, it, it's good for us to hear what the practices are at other institutions. Um, you know, it, we've said this in other policy areas too, you kind of cherry pick, you know, some good ideas and see how they're going to to um, be used perhaps at your institution. So thank you for sharing, sure. My you know, pleasure. what you all are doing. That's wonderful. We're greatly appreciative of what you do. We, um, your resources and these types of um, professional development is, it's a lifeblood for us. We love it. Well, thank you. So I thank appreciate you. that. Thank you, Denise. Uh, we also have in the chat, uh, Karen. Uh, Karen, would you like to share how things are going for you all? Sorry, I had to figure out mute real quick. Uh, actually, I, I just wanted to share, I really uh, appreciate peripherally on this discussion, the conversation between identifying differences between emergency remote teaching and online education and the quality that all of these pieces are part of. So I just uh, ran across that great read, actually identifying a possible term that we could call that emergency remote teaching so that it doesn't get confused in our educational circles with quality online education. So I thought that was a great read. So I was just sharing that with you all. But um, we are transitioning um, as everyone is. And I'm, I'm now putting that language into conversations at the different colleges. And that's working really well. They're like, oh, it's like, oh, okay. So I'm kind of concentrating that there is a difference. It's not the same. And what we did in the spring is different from what we're going to be doing in the summer. And we're already planning for the summer. So let's kind of talk about how we are going to caption, which you didn't in the spring, but sort of where Texas Tech was going as well. So thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's kind of, we're doing that same thing. So it's always great to hear that others are doing that same thing. That's great, Karen. I, I love hearing this distinction. I think that is very important for institutions and students to understand um, and faculty, you know, as we move forward. So thank you very much for that, Karen. And uh, just to let you all know, I will share the information that's in the chat with everybody uh, after this call. So we'll, we'll have the, so don't worry about, um, you know, the aspects of the chat that you may not be catching quickly. Um, let's see, we have Michael. Um, you're in Louisiana, uh, working for Western Governors. Can you uh, chat with us a little bit today, Michael? Can you hear me? Yes, you might ah, want to speak up that. just a hair. For sure. Um, sorry about that. I was muted and for some reason the keyboard shortcut uh, for Zoom didn't quite work. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Michael Osbin, and uh, I currently work for Western Governors University, which is an online competency-based education um, university uh, based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, even though we had been uh, online, uh, we definitely also have seen um, a little bit of, um, of, of interesting um, impacts as a result of COVID-19. Uh, for example, in our teachers college, uh, all of a sudden our teachers or our prospective teachers uh, who were going through a lot of their um, uh, residencies and, um, you know, in-person teaching and those sorts of things um, couldn't do that anymore. And so 
we had to, um, you know, very quickly try to figure out um, both accessible means of, of addressing that um, while also, um, you know, still providing um, that sort of uh, quality. And so one of the things that we've been saying a lot um, in terms of accessibility um, is looking directly to um, online proctoring uh, and making sure uh, that all of the different vendors that we're end up, uh, ending up using uh, are meeting um, our conformance standard that we've set forth as a university, which is uh, WCAG 2.1 uh, level AA. Um, and so my job specifically um, has been on the technical side, um, making sure that um, as we um, you know, shift a lot of our, our proctoring services and those sorts of things that um, we still are maintaining um, that accessibility standard so everybody has um, equal access, if that makes sense. Oh, that is very helpful, Michael. And I, and I appreciate the fact that you've been working in this space, you said, for 10 years now. Um, so you're bringing a, a wealth of experience and probably a lot of change um, for the better, I would assume, um, as we've moved forward in this work. I'm, I'm curious, what's the biggest difference that you've seen, um, say, in the last few years in terms of um, uh, tools and uh, ability to, um, to uh, benefit the students? I would say um, probably sort of the shift in mindset um, in a lot of cases. Um, so I got my start um, in 2010 at the University of Nevada, uh, and I've been uh, a long time member of the National Federation of the Blind, um, which I, I appreciated the shout out earlier uh, from Wichita State. Um, one of the things that I've personally observed is a lot of folks are starting to look at accessibility not as sort of an ad hoc accommodations model. Uh, that is, uh, a student encounters an accessibility barrier. Uh, oh no, what do we do now? We don't want to be sued. Um, instead, a lot of universities are starting to sort of look at it as um, a civil rights issue and um, looking at it as what can we do in order to ensure that everybody has equitable access and in that process, um, sort of being a little bit more proactive um, in the space. And so uh, I think one of the biggest benefits that I've seen um, come out of that is sort of the implementation of a lot of the accessibility tools um, directly within uh, learning management systems. So for example, um, Blackboard and uh, Canvas implement the Ally tool um, to be able to quickly convert um, documents into uh, multi uh, multimedia um, that is generally accessible. Of course, it requires um, some tweaks here and there. Um, but as a result of sort of mainstreaming um, some of the accessibility tools that are on on the market, um, I feel that you know a lot of folks are are starting to create that mind, mindset shift. If that makes sense. Yes, that does make sense. And so we're seeing it being much more of a student success model, would you say, than, um, you know, a, a have to as a as more of a want to? Um, Absolutely. Um, you know, through, through my work with uh, the National Association of Blind Students, which is a division of the National Federation of the Blind, um, I, I saw a lot of um, institutions always saying, you know, what could we do to be accessible. We want to make sure that our students are having equal access and being successful, but we just don't know how. And so um, I think that we're starting to see that folks are starting to rely on um, some of the um, resources that um, have been out there, but a little bit obscure or a little bit too uh, jargony. Um, for example, uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and starting to kind of take it out of the context of the ADA and shifting it more, like you said, towards that student success model. Great. Thank you very much for sharing, Michael. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. So we also have Teresa. Teresa, would you mind sharing how things are going at Texas Women's University? It looks like you're doing some good work there to share. Hello, everyone. I really appreciate Michael's comments because I think um, it, it's always so helpful when you have someone that really knows that walks the walk <laughs> involved in accessibility. So I really appreciate that. And I learned a lot from what he said. Uh, we are really just getting started um, at uh, Texas Women's University. We do not have a formal 
accessibility policy um, that is a directive to our instructors for what they need to do in their courses. So the Office of Teaching and Learning with Technology has, has kind of taken on this mantle. Uh, Dr. Linda Murphy is, is our director and, and uh, we're, we're really working towards trying to get our faculty and instructors trained on how they can make their online courses more accessible. And it couldn't have come at a better time with us all having to move to remote learning here for the last few few uh, weeks or months of our um, spring semester. Uh, so we had kind of started uh, rolling out a lot of different training opportunities, um, putting some things into webinar format, putting some how-to videos online, uh, working with um, an accessibility um, specialist to, to come to our campus and, and you know, kind of look at things we were doing and help us in, in the planning stages uh, to roll this out. Um, so we, we really have um, developed some partnerships, which I think is going to be key uh, in keeping this going at our university and may also be helpful for anyone that's kind of where we are or, or where, where we were just getting started, looking for ways to uh, make, make the move to uh, more accessible online um, inf instructional materials. Um, and the partnerships that we've developed are really kind of across our entire um, university. And by taking that approach, we're, we're trying to kind of make a, a community of practice so that it's something that can, can continue to, to move forward and mobilize uh, over time and not just be kind of a one and done shot at here's what you do and then no, no more, no, no more um, information. Um, a couple of the challenges that, that we are facing, uh, and I'd love to hear others' comments about it. Um, we, we, um, we're having a little bit of a struggle with the live captioning. We have um, several of our colleges that are using Zoom uh, for their uh, synchronous meetings. We have some that are trying to use Google Meet. Uh, and then currently, uh, our office and the Office of Technology uh, is supporting, but about to switch to a new product, uh, we're supporting Blackboard Collaborate and not the latest version, but um, an older version for, um, for web conferencing. So uh, we're, we're just kind of having a little bit of trouble kind of getting everyone to come together and settle on one product. It's a whole lot easier if we have one product that we're moving forward with, with, um, with live training, than if we're trying to basically help instructors that are using just all kinds of different uh, products. So that's been one of the challenges that we we faced is, is kind of getting everyone on board. Um, the, the other challenge has been a few face-to-face -face instructors are just adamant that they're not going to um, basically make corrections <laughs> to their um, auto-captioned, auto-generated captions. So we've had a lot of discussions, or at least I have with DSS about, you know, things that we can do to be proactive in, in making that happen. And um, we've kind of settled on um, meeting with uh, deans and, um, and administration to try to get it to be more of a top-down push that, yes, this is the law, yes, you have to do this. And, and uh, if you can't do this, who can provide some support in that area. We, DSS is already so stretched that we really would like for the individual colleges to kind of take on that mantle first. Um, and of course, in my office, there's only six instructional designers across three campuses. So that's not something that we can actually do for them. We can help them, but we, we can't actually do that for them. So those are some of the things that we're doing and some of the struggles that we're facing. And I'd love to hear what other people have to say about that. So, Charlotte, if you don't mind, I'll... Please jump. Sure, sure. So one thing I'll, I'll say, um, I don't know if um, you saw the email or not, it came out um, today, I believe, that, that Blackboard's actually sunsetting Collaborate Classic, um, I think this summer they're starting to. Um, there was an email, I, Sydney, I think, goes, goes away, you know, in the summer and something else goes away in the fall. So it, it's going to start being sunsetted if, if you're talking about Collaborate Classic. Um, we have had the same problems you are with the, the live captioning cart um, and the live captioning services. We only have so many um, to use. Um, now, we have seen a couple of faculty um, give students in their class the captioning role. Uh, with, within Collaborate, at least Collaborate Ultra, there, there's an option to say captioner. Uh, and so they've had a couple of students do that. They've actually... They've also had their TAs do it um, as well, which 
um, is, is probably not the best um, as you're not getting you know full full captions but at least you're getting something um, in kind of that same uh, area one thing we try to remind faculty and and you know if you don't if you're not able to do live captioning and record it make sure you can download that video so you can add the captions to it and upload it back into your 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 media server whatever that that media server might be um, so that's that's kind of where we're taking it so we're, we're having some people do it live captioned with the ta or ga or a student in the class some are using live cards that we have and then others are just downloading the video and we're providing the captions a day or two later um, it's not a great practice but it's it's as best as we can do um, um, right now Great, thank you, Justin. Uh, those of you that can see the chat, there have been some um, resources shared. Again, um, don't worry, I'm going to share the uh, chat. You'll see that there's been some responses to some of the questions um, that were posed uh, by Teresa. Um, and so we will, um, you'll be able to, to see that and, and see what the responses were. Um, and Justin's uh, just kind of over, gone over some of those aspects as well. So thank you very much, Justin. Um, before I get to my next question, I wanted to reach out to Cindy from Gallaudet University. She uh, was very helpful to Megan Raymond and I yesterday, um, teaching us about protocols and etiquette um, for uh, working with interpreters. And so we were really grateful for that. And Cindy offered us some information in the chat. And I was wondering if I could reach out to Cindy about sharing this, this information. Okay, so what, what I'll do instead, um, I didn't know if maybe that could work out um, based on how we were working yesterday. Oh, they're switching, <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, and so what I was wondering is, you know, Cindy offered something in the chat and I just wondered if that could be shared, you know, as part of the recording, um, but I can and go over that as well. So yes, if the contact wouldn't mind uh, sharing. Well, I, while we're, we're working on that, I just wanted to share with you that that is something that, you know, this is Zoom. Um, you know, we are uh, all working to try to find out what are the best ways to, um, to use the tools that we have available to us. Some of the, the, um, the different tools are not as obvious. Um, and uh, what we're able to provide here is, um, I, you know, yesterday I, I learned of some protocols. Um, and so I'm just gonna go ahead and, and share this. Um, Cindy was gracious, like I said, to, to teach Megan and I yesterday. She is, um, her name is Cindy Officer. She works with Gallaudet University, um, which is a liberal arts university. You all may uh, be aware for the deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, she is deaf and is accessing this webinar um, with a video relay service interpreter. And uh, so we worked with that a little bit yesterday. And um, so she's just going to uh, to say to us, you know, if, if any of you have sign language junior users in your synchronous environment, you don't have an interpreter in that environment already in this emergency situation. Um, she, she encourages your uh, signer to call their video relay service provider to get an interpreter to listen into class and interpret for the signer. Signers usually already have an app on their cell phones that will automatically bring sign language interpreter to the call. So, um, you know, if you all could just uh, be aware of that, I know it was a, it was a good learning for me, um, you know, to be able to um, be more accommodating uh, in the future as well. And, and Megan shared that we're using um, National Captioning um, Institute uh, for our summit. You know, we've got the summit coming up in a few weeks. Um, so there'll be live captioning and uh, there's no long-term contract uh, with these folks. Um, so, and they use people versus AI. So just so that you're aware of some different options. Um, okay, so we heard of some, we heard a couple of questions and we heard um, a little bit about um, 
what folks, that, some successes that folks have had. I was wondering if anyone has hit a road bump. And in that road bump, would you be willing to share with us what the road bump is? And we'll see if we can try to see if there's a direction that we can assist with this road bump. Is anybody willing to, um, to share that? Recognizing, of course, that we did this, you know, we, we've, we've heard many of our presenters today discussing how this was very quick, a week to two weeks, sometimes days, uh, to turn around to complete this semester. Um, we do have the summer coming up. Um, perhaps uh, folks will be looking on, um, you know, making sure that they have, uh, are returning to, um, to their, better, their other methods um, as they prepare. And sometimes with faculty members who ha don't have the same kind of background that maybe the distance education faculty members have. So, you know, it's doing a lot more um, focus than they're used to. Um, but we don't know how the summer will be moving forward and we don't know then what, how that moves us into the fall. But uh, would love to hear, you know, what maybe some of the bumps are um, that some institutions may be having, um, maybe buying in, getting buy-in from faculty. You know, we're hearing that buy-in sometimes is a challenge um, or some of the tools that they're looking for to assist them. Cheryl, uh, yes. this is this Teresa O'Dowd again at, at right. TWU. I would love to hear what, um, what others are using for um, online test proctoring uh, we currently use Respondus, and that has been one area that can sometimes present a challenge. Obviously, from an instructional uh, designer point of view, which that's what I do at, um, at TWU, we really recommend, um, you know, instructors in, in online courses not even attempt to use something like that. We, we try to provide them with, with alternative assessment type things uh, that they can do in their courses. But a lot of these face-to-face, um, -face, I'm going to call them face-to-face -face instructors that have been forced to move online and really haven't had the training and, and uh, have, have any idea of the online pedagogy that goes behind really creating a quality online course. Um, that's not something they, they're, you know, willing to do. They, they really want to just go ahead and continue to use the objective um, instruments that they've been using to assess their students and they uh, want to lock things down as tightly as they can and that is not always the best practice for any student and particularly for students um, with uh, disabilities so we've really been working hard to try to explain that to them and and kind of guide them away from those practices into some better uh, online practices uh, but I would love to hear what are um, some other institutions using for um, online proctoring of, of exams um, perhaps there's a product out there that would would provide some, some <laughs> something better than respondus although I have a feeling the the real the best practice is just to not do that at all and move to different kinds of assessments but I'd still love to hear what others are doing great Justin could you share a bit about what you're using Oh, sure. Um, I was going to say that, that at Texas Tech, we're, we're using both um, Respondus Lockdown Browser, um, which we've had for a long time, and Proctorio, which is our remote proctoring tool. Um, Proctorio, uh, we do have the VPAT and is, is accessible, um, but we're, we're encouraging faculty not to, we're encouraging faculty to use it if they want to, but because students have to have a, a webcam and a, and a microphone, um, and, it, and at this time of the year, with so many students losing their job, going out to buy a $20 webcam may not be the best um, fiscal decision for, for these kids. It may be between a webcam and, and food. Um, so we're trying to encourage faculty to utilize some of those tools within Blackboard. Um, the, the question banks, if they can, um, uh, randomize the question questions, you know, uh, give a timed exam, all of those things that, that um, allow for a little more flexibility on the student side. Um, if they insist on having a locked down experience, then, then we'll go to the Respondus Lockdown Browser um, because that, that's really just uh, something to download. But the other thing that, that we have come, uh, uh, come up against, and I'm sure everybody else has, or many others, although we think of today's college student as a digital native, um, downloading and installing a program on their computer may not be what they're comfortable doing. Um, you know, they may, you know, be comfortable with, with social media and, and all of that, but, but in, uh, 
uh, downloading a program on the computer may be a little too much. So trying to lessen that, that anxiety factor um, for so many students. Um, so Teresa, like, like you, we're, we're providing options, but if faculty are, are really pushing to use one tool over another, we will help them and we'll, we'll work with them. Our IT department has purchased lots of, of webcams for students to check out if they didn't have any um, as a loaner for the rest of the semester. Um, so that's, that's worked a little bit, um, but you know, trying to find the best tool once again in a, in a very quick situation. Thank you, Justin. I really appreciate that. Uh, John, how are things going in Wichita? Do you have some, some direction there as well? Uh, we're, we're in a similar situation. We've been, uh, for our online programs, we've been a Proctor U school, um, which has human proctoring, but um, with all of the demand coming from all the new programs, Proctor U has been struggling to keep up and we can't afford that much uh, human proctoring for the, the flood of new demand uh, there. So we've uh, picked up Respondus Lockdown Browser and Monitor um, which is AI driven monitoring um, and they were offering a great deal if you haven't looked at it lately It's like free for a couple of months. So that'll get us through um, The I agree that we absolutely would prefer to be in a situation where uh, Proctoring wasn't necessary because the nature of the exams and the assessments that were being given was uh, more authentic and less uh, just sort of this the, the types of exams that are easy to to uh, cheat at, um, but that's that's a, a awfully tough hill to fight on when we're trying to, to figure everything else out. Um, one of the situations that we weren't anticipating uh, that has turned into a problem for us is uh, our uh, IT area, um, when we started looking at the challenge of going online, very quickly reached out and purchased uh, a couple of hundred uh, Chromebooks to distribute to students who didn't have any other, didn't have a computer uh, for home use or needed something along those lines. Um, and that was a great idea and everybody was very happy. And then we discovered in the process that Chromebooks, because of a limitation or, or something that's shut down in the, the Chrome browser, um, isn't able to, isn't open to the, the controls of the, lock, the Respondus platform or for that matter, the ProctorU platform. So um, we're having to look at alternatives for proctoring for anyone who's using one of those university provided Chromebooks. Um, luckily they have webcams, uh, which not all Chromebooks do, um, but that has been a challenge. Um, but now, uh, thanks to Justin, I know where all the webcams went because we've been having a terrible time trying to source them around here. Um, so apparently they're in Texas. Uh, but. Uh, uh, that's, that's been our situation. We're actually going to be experimenting a bit with uh, some ad hoc uh, Zoom proctoring that we do the same way we might proctor uh, uh, something locally, a staff member or the faculty member themselves proctors, uh, just builds a, a, a Zoom session with uh, uh, four or five uh, students who are taking the exam and just monitors their exam through a webcam that way. It's nowhere near as secure as a lockdown environment, but at least it's something. I appreciate that, that you've, you've tried to find workarounds where you can. So sometimes you have to go with a plan B um, when you're trying to uh, weigh everything. Um, so thank you very much, John. That was really helpful. Um, Michael has shared some things in um, the chat. They look like they're uh, Slack channels where you can get resources. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about this? You need me to help you unmute? Sorry. Oh, there you are. Good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry so if you could tell us a little bit about the resources that you shared. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the first resource that I shared is specifically for folks who are working within um, disability services offices or um, within accessibility in higher education. Um, a couple of us who um, were um, both disabled and working in this space decided that we needed a space where we could collaborate and um, come up with um, all sorts of different ideas to address some of the um, unique concerns as we all pivoted um, to higher education. Um, and so if you um, join that group, you have access to um, 
uh, several different uh, channels that deal with um, various disability um, identity types um, and you know different methods for um, creating accommodations uh, for those um, different groups as well as a general chat where folks um, are you know are introducing themselves and um, uh, collaborating that way um, and sort of sharing uh, resources and tips and tricks as they sort of um, come across those. Um, the second er, link that I dropped into the chat um, deals specifically with, um, well, it doesn't specifically deal with anything. Um, the wonderful piece to, to that one is uh, it has about 6,000 or so um, accessibility professionals um, across the industry uh, in higher education, in um, accessibility firms like Level Access, DQ Systems, um, Site and Peru, um, the Posiello Group. Um, it has folks from Microsoft and Google and Apple and basically um, every industry that you can think of, including um, folks who work in cruise ships. Um, and it has, uh, I don't know, probably about 40 different channels or so. Um, but anytime that anybody runs into um, any sort of digital accessibility issue, um, lots of folks drop, drop their questions in there and uh, within, you know, a couple of minutes, they've got, you know, 15 responses um, from folks willing to, um, you know, troubleshoot or provide suggestions or resources for them to be able to solve the problems that they're encountering. And so I thought that would be a, a really invaluable resource for everybody here um, as we, you know, continue to navigate this space for an undetermined amount of time. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. You know, it's good to know that there's a network that you can um, reach out to. I would also encourage folks to use WCET Mix um, so that we can, you know, I, I think this is great what Michael has shared. Um, and also within our own community, um, we have WCET Mix to do a similar thing, to be able to share resources and ask questions um, along those lines. I, I, we're, we're coming to close to the top of the hour. So I'd like to give uh, Brenda, if you don't mind, Brenda, I'd like to give you the final word. You, you brought up a, a good point about assessment. So I'd like to kind of send us out a little bit with uh, your, your thought about assessments and then I'll close for the, for the session. Sure, you know, that's, a, that's something we're hearing a lot that faculty are rushing to proctored exams for assessment because that seems like, okay, that's what I would do face to face, so that's what I'll do online. So maybe there are some things that you've already assessed to this point in the semester that don't really need to be assessed anymore. And maybe there are some authentic assessments that can be developed that will enable learners to demonstrate what they have learned in another way. Um, a friend of mine was he had to pivot and he he's an instructor in Kentucky and he said well I just wanted to take he said they were supposed to do presentations so he turned them into blogs like it doesn't have to be like this big high-tech solution and then the students can see them and respond to each other so these seem like real you know basic solutions but ways to help them with um, with taking you know the stress out because we're all under stress right now and helping um, see where learners are they may have their children at home with them not working what are some ways we can help them demonstrate their learning without having to add another layer don't add more stuff at this point <laughs> um, and so are there ways that you could assess that are more in alignment with you know that type of an authentic assessment how can you apply these things to your regular life so um. oh that's a good note Brenda thank you very much for pointing that out because that, that you know we are we're we're coming up with good alternatives here and thank you for and developing we've been talking about that within WCET staff too that that's been a real priority to try to um, help institutions get to that point so thanks for that message Brenda um, so we're, we're at the top of the hour and I just want to thank everybody for being here today I want to thank Brenda Boyd uh, Mark Picaro uh, John Jones and um, Justin Lauder for helping me facilitate this and for all of you who provided excellent uh, comments and uh, questions so that we could have you know a very um, full conversation today so look for more mess more of these types of uh, dinner parties we're gonna come up with other topics um, that we can do this too we found that this is a valuable resource. Those of you that are also members of SAN will know we do this in open forum uh, once a month with SAN topics. So we think this is great. We love interacting with our members. So you all have a wonderful day. Look for all of this to be
um, to be shared um, on the website. And uh, I will also send out the uh, group chat and um, you'll see a transcript and the recording. So have a great day, everybody, and take care. Bye-bye.